Welcome. This is the second talk in the Faith in the Time of COVID series organised by Archbishop Leo Cushley. My name is Matt. Our speaker today is Dr Mary Rice Hassan. She is the Cato Byrne Fellow in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Centre in Washington DC and also directs the Catholic Women's Forum. Her talk is titled Reflections on Faith and Religious Freedom. Mary Rice Hassan, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here and especially to follow on the remarks of Bishop Egan. And I hope my reflections on religious liberty will be uh, complementary to the insights that you took away from last week. So one of the things that is part of the human condition is that we want to control things. We want to know what's around the next corner. Next slide. But what we have to accept is that sometimes we just can't see what's around the next corner. And I think we have a phrase that says, sometimes you just can't see there from here. And when I think back to a year ago, when the COVID crisis was beginning, that's the phrase that comes to mind, that a year ago, we had no idea how this was going to unfold. Next slide. In the US, I remember the press conference when our president came forward and said that we had 10 days to slow the spread and we needed to lock down or there would be up to 200,000 deaths. We could not know then that we have had more than 400,000 lives lost because of COVID. There were so many unknowns from the means of transmission to treatment, to prognosis, to the real risk of dying, we didn't know. And the church responded quite appropriately by collaborating for the sake of the common good, by seeking to protect the most vulnerable. There was a lot of goodwill, but there was also a lot of fear. And I think there was misplaced reliance just across the board within the culture in the hopes that medicine and the experts would be able to get us through, that that would be enough. Next slide. But in reality, as the COVID crisis continued, as the pandemic continued, we saw even as, as some of the, the medical things clarified, churches were still shut down or were still restricted. And there was a real sense of being lost. And, and I'm sure for many of you, you remember as I do quite vividly that moment when Pope Francis stood on the, you know, above the St. Peter's Square and blessed the world with the Eucharist. It was such a powerful reminder that we are, as human persons, we're body and soul. And that medicine, while we rely on it, we need it, is limited in its ability to, to take care of everything, that we need to trust God. So I want to focus in particular on some of the challenges that we experienced in the nature of religious liberty. Certainly the COVID crisis has brought challenges in many fronts from the health challenges to logistical challenges, employment, economic, but I wanna focus here on religious liberty and explain why uh, from a US perspective, but from my own research in terms of, of your situation in Scotland, it's tracked in a very similar way, much of what we experienced in the US. So at the outset, that, that period of cooperation between church and state, our expectations were that, first of all, that the pandemic would be of short duration and therefore that the clampdown on religious liberty, whatever was necessary, would be of short duration. In reality, it turned out to be indefinite. It's continuing. And in the beginning, while government was trusted, partly because in our system of government, we have the First Amendment. It's one of the first things that school children learn that in our constitution, we have the First Amendment that protects the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion. It's, it's part of who we are as Americans. And so there was a great deal of trust among religious believers that surely the government would be even handed and fair, even as it needed to limit things, that it would do no more than was necessary. And yet what proved to be the case, playing out differently in different parts of the country, but under some governors, 
the administration of those, those controls and restrictions was arbitrary. It was unfair. And so religious believers found themselves unable to go to the funerals of loved ones. And I know people who, who suffered through that. And yet the government turned a blind eye and, and uh, supported mass protests in the streets uh, for racial justice. And so this, this sense that the spiritual needs of people were being not just overlooked, but perhaps minimized and, and in some respects demonized. There were some quarters who, who blamed churches and singing as, as being early um, means of transmission. So it was, it was unexpected that, these, that our religious liberty was not respected in the way that it should have been. And most importantly, the phrase that came to be a real sticking point that the government started, when the government started opening things up, it opened up services that it believed were quote, essential. And yet in too many jurisdictions, religion, worship, religious ritual was deemed non-essential and those restrictions remained. So this played out of course in the courts. In the beginning, there were lawsuits uh, filed back in the spring of last year where the churches that sued lost and, and Catholic churches were not at the forefront of bringing those lawsuits. And I think, again, it was that sense of deference that will try to work with the authorities kind of on the side or one-on-one or -on -one and, and try to collaborate. So the early lawsuits were lost at the Supreme Court, both in the spring and the summer, but something changed as the pandemic wore on and churches in many jurisdictions still suffered under more restrictions than businesses, than schools. Another lawsuit was brought in November against New York, the government of New York. The governor had imposed very severe restrictions. And so it was a, a suit brought by an Orthodox Jewish community that had really been persecuted in many respects with the government continually trying to shut down their, their religious services while allowing other things to go on. And they partnered with the Brooklyn Diocese, the Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, New York, and brought this case to the Supreme Court and they won. So what you might ask changed? Well, the Supreme Court emphasized several things. And I see again, this playing out in, in a similar way here in Scotland. The court emphasized that yes, the government has a responsibility to protect the people, particularly in a time of pandemic, but civil rights and a fundamental right like religious liberty cannot be suppressed indefinitely. So the longer something goes on, the longer the crisis continues, the less imperative it is for the government to restrict those basic civil liberties, that people need to be able to exercise their fundamental rights. Another factor in the court's decision was the unfairness. The court looked at how government was treating businesses other, other enterprises that also had large spaces. So for example, one uh, Christian church leader who was pastor of, of what we would call a mega church, just a, a huge church that would seat thousands upon thousands of people, plenty of space. He said, you know, if instead of pews in my church, I had appliances and then just invited people to come in and we did our usual worship, that would have been okay with the government. But because we are a church, the, governor, the government shut this down. And, and so that unfairness, that, that uh, arbitrariness, and then also the imperative on the government to learn and to choose the least restrictive means. So nine months into the pandemic, we have learned a lot about the COVID virus. We know more about how it's transmitted. We know more about uh, what it takes to, to prevent, to keep people safe, to protect the vulnerable. We know more who's at risk. And so the court was emphasizing that government needs to learn and to take the narrowest possible restriction. So even though there was that victory in November, in the state of California, the governor continued 
to repress religion to the point that the, the major cathedral in San Francisco, just a huge, huge building, only one person was allowed to go in at a time to pray. And indoor worship was still not allowed, even though businesses, restaurants, and, and uh, other, other large buildings were open, workplaces. And so Archbishop Cordelione, uh, who's a, a fantastic bishop, and he's out there in San Francisco, he said to his priests, you know, we have the Supreme Court now saying and affirming to the country that this is a fundamental right and that these restrictions are are onerous. They are they are not permitted by law. And so he's, he told his priest to go ahead and celebrate mass indoors. And then they continued. Another church finally got, another church in California got its lawsuit up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, sure enough, slapped California down and said, no, you must back off on these restrictions. And so it was a long journey. But what, what should we take from that? Why was there this sense that religion was non-essential? So next slide. I think it's important that we understand uh, what it is about religion. And here's a great quote, actually. This, uh, there was one pastor who said, you know, I, I'm less troubled by the fact that the government views religion as non-essential, but more troubled by the fact that Catholics seem to agree. And what he was referring to was, was people being complacent and, and little outrage. And, and while people originally did a lot of the video uh, masses and things, that, that tapered off as well. So this was a challenge that he delivered that we might expect some pushback from the government, but we need to expect more from our people. And so next slide, let's consider the whole idea of religious freedom. Why? Why does religious freedom matter? And if we go back to the documents of Vatican II, the Declaration on Religious Freedom, it's a beautiful document that sets out what we believe. It answers that question, why religious freedom? And the key points are this, that every human person is built by nature to seek God, to seek the truth, and in finding God, to embrace him, to embrace the truths that they found, and to organize their lives accordingly. That's the religious impulse that's common to every human being. And so religious liberty precedes the state, and a, a person's search for God and search for truth is so sacred and so profound, it can never be coerced, whether by other individuals or by the state. So the state has a limited capacity to, um, to infringe or impose laws that are going to affect religious liberty. And then finally, the, this document reaffirmed that religious freedom is not just a right of the individual, but we gather together in communities of believers and as communities of believers, we have a right to religious freedom as well. So in sum, it's a fundamental right. Every human person has this right to religious freedom. Religious liberty is not granted or bestowed by the state. In other words, there are limits. It doesn't, religious freedom doesn't come from the First Amendment. It doesn't come from your, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All of those are instruments that civil government uses to protect religious freedom. At least that is, that's the intent behind it. And then finally, we protect religious liberty because it contributes to human flourishing. And that's an argument that we can make in a very pragmatic way to appeal to those who may not share our religious belief. So why, if religious freedom is so important, why did we not see this outcry, certainly in America where we have this great tradition, but in, in your country as well, Next slide. Well, one of the things that is very interesting is that uh, I saw an opinion poll of Scottish citizens and the overwhelming majority supported how the government was dealing with COVID. And it was left to the bishops to be the lonely voices crying out saying, wait a minute, you know, this is going too far when you're closing our, our places of worship. Next slide. 
So why? Why is it that so many of our, our fellow citizens view religious liberty as non-essential? I think there are three reasons. One, the decline of Christianity across the board. So there are fewer believers. And what that means in practical terms is that there are fewer people who have an experience of faith, who understand why it's important. And in Scotland, in Scotland I, was, I knew it was more secular than the US um, and saw in 2018, the statistics saying that 51% of the population professes to be nuns, whereas Catholicism has been pretty constant. It dropped a bit from 15 to 14% of the population. So more than half of the adult population says they're nothing, they're, they uh, shrug their, their shoulders when it comes to faith. But the troubling number is that among young people, it's much higher. It's almost 70% of young people who profess to have no religious belief. So if you have no experience, you don't think it's important, you're not going to fight for it. You're not going to be upset when it's, it's taken away. Another reason why religion is viewed as non-essential is that as fewer and fewer people experience it, religion comes to be viewed as something like a hobby. It's something that some people like to do but there's no special significance. And in tandem with that is the third point, that over the past several decades, as secularism has advanced, but also as we've had numerous scandals, not just within our own church, but across a, a number of religious denominations, religion is increasingly perceived as having no social value. And particularly in, in the UK, where the government does so many of the social services, it's easy for people to step back and say, well, what difference does it make if we have a Christian um, soup kitchen or a government soup kitchen? We really don't need it. So these are reasons why among the general public, there's a giant shrug of the shoulders. Religion is non-essential. Next slide. So what do we do? Next. I wanna suggest several things. One, we need to assert our legal rights. And right now I, I saw that there's a, a lawsuit being brought by a number of Christian congregations challenging Scotland's uh, closure of the churches. And they're appealing to the uh, Convention on Human Rights, the Scottish constitution. And, and that's fantastic. And let me emphasize here that as Catholics, we don't always have to be the ones bringing the lawsuit but we need to be supportive of and, and speaking out for those who are defending religious liberty. The legal efforts are important, not just to set the legal guardrails to limit the government's action, but because law is a teacher. It tells people that this is important. And so that's a significant reason why we need to assert legal rights. Next slide. We need to teach, we need to speak up boldly. So the Bishop's statement, in January, just last month, in response to the government's continued closure, I thought had just fantastic points, particularly the idea that uh, emphasizing the benefits of, of religious belief to the person and to society, speaking of it as a fundamental human right, and in fact, reminding people that as creatures, it's our duty to worship God. It's not, religion's not just horizontal, it's, it's vertical first between us and God. And then also to Catholics speaking directly, reminding Catholics that virtual uh, masses are just not the same because we believe in the real presence. We, we need to, to literally be in communion with the Lord. And so there's no substitute for the sacraments. And it was interesting to see the government's response to the initial uh, claims from the Christian churches where the governments, the government specifically said, no, virtual is good enough. And yet for Catholics, virtual might be a stopgap, but it is not the same because we're a, a religion of presence, of faith, of communion. Next slide. So it's important uh, for us to push back legally. It's important to teach. It's important also to mount a communications campaign, to win people's hearts and minds, to educate people, help them to understand what social science tells us, which social science very much supports the value of religion to society. It gives meaning 
It gives a sense of identity, belonging, purpose. It helps to guide the choices that people make in life. And it gives us that social sphere when isolation is, is so much a problem. And I love the, the phrase that uh, I heard one physician say that in the midst of this COVID crisis, people turn to medicine without realizing that medicine can extend life, but it cannot provide meaning. That's where faith comes in. Faith provides that meaning for life. So the church also needs to message the important link between the practice of religious faith and mental health. It doesn't mean that if you're a believer, you're never gonna struggle with depression, but the statistics do show that people who have a strong faith, not just because they have a faith community, but because of faith itself, are more resilient in terms of facing the crises in their lives. Next slide. And this is particularly important when it comes to questions like suicide. We have seen, certainly in the US, uh, we've, we've just seen a spike in suicides as people are searching for meaning and yet there are no answers. But we know, just, I, just let me reassure you, there are many, many studies stressing the importance of religious faith in helping people recover from depression, in helping them be resilient in the midst of stress. It's, it's an amazingly powerful thing that God has built into us, but we need to message that to the secular world. Next slide. So at the final point, what else should we do? Give personal witness. Our faith needs to be visible. Some of you may remember the old catechism formulation that we're called to know, love, and serve God in this world in order to be happy with him in the next. I think our witness is very much the same. We have to claim that identify, know who, that identity, know who we are, sons or daughters of the Lord. And then we need to be confident and bold and visible and share that, invite others into that relationship. If only by saying, you know, I pray for you. What's on your heart? What can I pray for? for you. If you can't invite them to church, we can always pray for others, but let them know. Let them know there's a connection there that God cares about their lives. And then we're, we're Christians on mission. We have to evangelize. So the world needs Christ. So when we look at this COVID crisis, let me just give you that sense, not just of hope, hope in, in the power of God, but that sense of mission and purpose, that this is an opportunity when people are searching for meaning, they feel isolated, we have the answer. We have the treasure in our faith. We have the treasure in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the world needs Christ. Let's bring him to them. So I leave you with that powerful image from the Pope. Thank you, Dr. Mary Rice Hassan. That was a fantastic image to, to end on. What were your thoughts? Were you watching it that day when uh, Pope Francis was in, in the St. Peter's Square. I, I was. I was watching it, and I, I was just moved to tears. Just the, the desolation of the scene, and then the beauty of the Eucharist, and, and the Pope's profound humility in, in just, uh, you know, offering Christ to the world. And it, it was just so powerful, so powerful. I want to ask Dr. Mary Rice Hassan a question. Please use the Q and a function. We've only got a We've gone until half past. Um, someone's asked virtual masses. Well, <clears throat> some people disagree, but with one person here saying virtual masses are okay. It is not the same, but we are about safety. So she disagrees with your talk. What would be your message to her? Well, look, one thing the church has said in giving the, the dispensations, for example, from mass, like where, where I am in my diocese, no one is required to come to church. And what the bishop has said is that each person must judge for themselves. The churches are open, but each person must judge for themselves their own risk, their vulnerability. But at the same time, he's encouraged us not to live in fear, to have concern and care for others. So to follow all the guidelines and, and our churches have been uh, terrific. And, and from what I've seen of Scotland, it, it, the churches throughout last year really seem to take that to heart. No one's being reckless, but we're not just material beings. You know, we need God, we need communion is something we can only have in person and we need each other. So each person has to decide what, what they're called to do. 
But I, I think as a church, we need to be there. We need to open the churches. Yeah, it's certainly difficult. And it's, it's very controversial. Some people disagreeing with what's happening. Others saying mm -hmm. it's, it's compliance. I suppose they've all got a, a point, especially in Scotland or America. Uh, I'd like to bring in Archbishop Leo Cushley now, please, who's going to join us if you just want to unmute and get yourself yep. on camera. Hi there, good, good evening. evening. Hello. Good evening, Doctor. May I call you Mary? <laughs> yes, please do. Um, this is us. Uh, we, we've, we've chatted, but we haven't actually seen each other. So it's, it's great <laughs> to see you. Welcome, welcome. You um, Thank that you. Was, that was great. That was a really good talk. Um, it was, I was drawing parallels again and again between our situation here and, and your own, Mary. Um, tell mm -hmm. me, first of all, are, are you guys able to get to Mass? Yes, we are. In, in the state of Virginia, um, the bishops worked closely with our governor to encourage him to trust them to take the guidelines seriously. And, and in tracking, the churches have not been a source of contagion. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so part of the emphasis for the church has been to say to the government, please pay attention to the evidence. Let's not be just driven by fear and making assumptions. But if the churches are not a source of contagion, we're taking this seriously, we need to open. And I think especially as the mental health crisis has deepened, I think there's been more willingness on the part of the government to realize people need each other and people of faith need that strength and that sustenance that comes from worshiping together. Yes, no, I'd, I'd agree with all of that. But just to give you an idea, um, of, of what it's been like after the bishops made their, their statement. I mean, even arriving at that statement, um, mm -hmm. you would think that we were all, we're, we're, we're one guy, uh, but we're not. We, we had, there were, there were eight of us when we were putting that together. Um, one, of, uh, one of us, uh, Archbishop Philip Latalia, has since died from complications and, mm -hmm. and he had COVID. Um, so um, I think COVID is at least indirectly responsible for his, his death as well, and a great shock and a loss to us in our very small uh, corner of the Lord's vineyard here. So it's had its impact upon us. But as we put that letter together, um, it, it, was, it wasn't easy for us to get there because not everyone feels just 100% precisely like what you see there. The, the letter becomes a as it were, a, 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 an inevitable compromise uh, because it's crafted by us all together. Um, but the reaction to it was, was very interesting because um, I didn't see a very great deal in the media that was positive about it, on the contrary. And then you, you, I have my, my inbox to look at, uh, or, or, or my, my paper inbox as well, my, the post box. And the reactions to it, um, the only reactions I got were from Catholics. Um, so th there'll be plenty of other reactions out there. And I had about the same number of reactions against and for. Just, just to let you know, it, it, very interesting mm -hmm. as an academic and social exercise. Um, mm -hmm. There were people and they felt very strongly about it on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, that so churches must be closed because mm. it's, it is a it's, a it's a duty of responsibility to everybody to keep each other safe and, and I think this time round we're all taking it a little bit more seriously we're feeling a bit darker this time round because we had our first mm. lockdown this is us in the middle of our second one here but mm. you have people on the other side of this um, saying that we must have our churches open no matter what it costs and and we should be mm -hmm. you know even one or two maybe even urging some civil disobedience about this and we, mm -hmm. we have to do this anyway um but uh, there is also a memory that in this country that goes with that um since since catholics were not allowed to practice in public practice their their, their faith for centuries mm -hmm. in this country we're still very sensitive to that Mm -hmm. And and the the smaller Presbyterian churches who were persecuted for a, a while as well, they too feel this fairly keenly, and they do not like it mm -hmm. at all. Um, so it, it, just just to let you know, you've got both sides mm -hmm. of this um, felt quite strongly mm -hmm. among Christians, among committed Catholics, mm -hmm. and other Christians as well. Do you want, do you want to respond yeah. to that briefly? Yeah, yeah. Just I, the thing that I think is important is that we as Christians don't judge another's motivation. Number one. But we also have to, to give each other that hope of the Christian life. You know, my, my father used to say that, who, who's now deceased, he used to say that death is a change of address. 
and that we look forward to eternal life. And that one of the problems in, in this world is that there is that finite vision that this life is all we've got and we've got to hold on to it with all our hearts. And, and that doesn't mean we don't suffer the loss when someone dies, but it does mean that we want to elevate our eyes to that farther horizon and realize none of us knows the day nor the hour. Mm -hmm. And we need to live in fidelity to God uh, in the meantime, again, with prudence and common sense and, and yes. care for the most vulnerable. But, yes. Yes, no, I completely agree. Common sense and no, if I may, uh, Matt, um, no, I completely agree. But in here, we have gone from the Scottish government at last autumn, last fall, telling us about the spiritual value of keeping our churches open when they were mm. being closed in England. And now they're open in England, and we're being told we've got to close yeah. them because it's the thing to do. Meanwhile, the golf courses were closed in Scotland on that occasion, and now they're open, and it's the other way yeah. around in England. It's as if they're sort of playing cards with well we're going to close that and we're going to open that and right I'm sure I, I mean i'm being a little flippant and saying that that's a little unkind or unfair but but it does it does make you scratch your head a wee bit doesn't it mm -hmm. anyway i'm that's sure yeah. we've got one or two more things for us before we go matt i think that's just about gone half past um it's flown in as usual uh, thanks dr mayor rice hassan very much for joining us that's a brilliant talk i really enjoyed it just to let people know that next week's Thank talk you. is with professor john haldane uh, at five o'clock, that's Valentine's Day, you can register at the address on the screen. The next week is the Right Honourable Gordon Brown. So please do join us. But in the meantime, thanks once again to Dr. Mary Hassan and to Archbishop Leo Kishley, and most of all to you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Bye.